Good afternoon, Leah. Thank you so much for having us um, and getting us involved in the topic, opportunities offered by technology in the lifting sector. My name is Marlisa Joy, and I'm the Senior Business Development Manager for Reconnect. Everyone knows that there are thousands and millions of apps developed um, out there, but mostly for people in the consumer world and not as much for us in the workplace. Um, and I think that is one of the first opportunities that we can point out is to create more of these technologies for us in the workplace to make our lives easier and more efficient. So we believe from our perspective that uh, these technologies that's been developed for the consumers, like mobile applications, IoT, iCloud, will soon diffuse into the industrial landscape. Not just in the lifting or manufacturing, but into all areas of our work life. So we believe technology will make lifting industry more sustainable, more efficient, and create a safer environment for everybody. So let's look at some of the technology trends. So we've got chat GPT AI, it's a hot topic. Everybody, uh, I think is familiar with it and everybody is discussing it. It's where you can ask a question and get a straight answer from an AI. You don't have to Google or type anything into Google anymore and do your own research, you get a straight answer. iCloud uh, technology that is now hosted to someone else. Uh, it's not in your house anymore, so it's safer and also gives you a bit more freedom. IoT technology, where you create a crane or your equipment with software where you can get proper telemetrics status and data from that. Robotics, that's also been around for many years. Uh, some of these technologies is, is quite new. Some has already been around for 10 to 15 years. Robots is not a new thing. Um, and I think it fills gaps where we've seen shortages with labor and skills and things like that. It can perform a very fine welding on certain certain jobs and certain, certain equipments. And it can also lift very heavy things that um, human beings struggle to do or can't do. Then mobility. Everybody has got an Apple or Android device. It's, uh, I know or don't know anybody that will be able to cope without that. It's extremely convenient. Then sustainable technology. Um, I think everybody is, uh, it's also a very, a uh, popular topic to be a bit more sustainable, uh, especially in Europe where we've seen very high energy prices and people looking for more sustainable solutions like renewable energies, etc. Then the lifting trend, I think we are all familiar with the labour and uh, skill shortages that we've seen in, especially in the lifting industry. We spoke speak for myself where we struggle to get um, skills in our industry. Safety requirements, something Leah has been very well at driving and then creating a greener future for everybody. The first use case uh, we can refer to is a cloud-based crane safety system where it captures and streams real-time video and analytics simultaneously. So it's, it's, it's a video, um, it's a camera that's installed inside the crane or a screen and then uh, cameras outside on the ground to perform lifts and place certain objects around the yard. That could easily fill gaps where you've seen skill shortages or people shortages um, where these cameras could fill gaps. It tells you exactly how to put things down, where to put it down. It gives you a clearer picture on what's happening on the grounds, etc. This is iCloud based, it's, uh, it's mobile, it's IoT enabled. It creates definitely a safer environment for everybody and working towards a greener future. Use case number two, anti-collision system. This could either be on an overhead crane or tower crane. It's IoT enabled. Um, it's limits that you set on certain equipment to avoid obviously collisions. So when you're on a construction site and there are 50 to 100 tower cranes, you set certain limits or limits um, so that these cranes cannot collide, especially when you everybody is lifting their own loads, they've got their own agendas and their own tasks to perform. It's easy, easy where something could creep in and you could collide either with someone or with another crane. So this uh, technology helps you to avoid that. It's, uh, it's cloud-based, it's IoT enabled, it definitely creates a safer environment. 
and working towards a greener future. And then last but not the least, Reconnect is a critical asset management system. Um, it, is, it works with a mobile device, it's a mobile app and your desktop. It uh, also works with an RFID tag that you attach to the specific equipment. It's got full traceability of all your equipment. So it starts with a manufacturer um, all the manufacturing documents that gets uploaded. You can perform pre-use checks. So you have pre-use checks that you customize towards uh, or for a specific equipment um, or equipment. Um, and you can perform your pre-use checks. It stores the history thereof, as well as maintenance and inspections. It's got full traceability, so it's, it stores all the history. So as I said, where it starts from the manufacturer to the end user, all the history of that specific equipment or item will always be stored on an RFID tag. That fits in with, it's iCloud based, it's IoT enabled, it's, uh, it's got a mobile device, sustainable technology, it definitely creates a safer environment and working towards a greener future where we eliminate paperwork and heaps of files, storage and things like that. So we believe technology will make the lifting industry more sustainable, more efficient and create a safer environment. Thank you very much. Hi, and thanks very much for, for joining this webinar to learn about digital transformation and how it's key to securing your future in the lifting industry. Quick introduction of myself. My name is Chris McCartney, and I work for Core RFID. Uh, I've been now helping organisations with their digital initiatives and transformation projects for, for 20 years. Um, and the reason why we are touching on digital transformation today um, is because of I've recently been um, brought into the, the lifting culture as it was as it was termed at the Lear Golf Day that I, that I was that I took part in a good couple of weeks ago and from my experience with it, within software with from in digital transformation across many verticals such as uh, housing legal local and central governments and after meeting um, well well over a hundred people now within the lifting world um, it is quite apparent that on a digital maturity and digital transformation journey, the lifting industry is, is fairly immature compared to other sectors. So as an organisation, we thought it would be really um, invited really to actually share some, some information regarding it and try and inform uh, the industry what it's about and how it can benefit you guys uh, and your organisation. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to touch on what is digital transformation? Why should you care about it? Uh, we'll touch on to some real life examples um, into where it's been put into practice and changed the industry and really benefited organisations. And then we'll show you a very specific example uh, for your industry, a, a small part of uh, digital transformation and the benefits it can have for you as an organisation. So first of all, what, you know, there's a great, a great saying here from Jeff Bezos, love them or hate them. Um, there's not many people that have done more in the industry over the last 20 years to digitally advance many verticals and many industries. And he has a great saying about digital transformation is there is no alternative to DT. Companies will carve out new strategic options for themselves and those that don't will fail. And there's a, there's a, a great example that we try and use that. And I think for trying to get your, your head in the right place, to actually, what is digital transformation? not just fancy slogans or, or, or buzzwords in the IT and software world, is libraries. Libraries is a great example for it. So for centuries, the source of all knowledge, all information, you know, back to, back to the Greeks into modern times, um, that is where you went to get all your information, all your knowledge. If you wanted to learn about a subject, you know, be it as serious as, uh, as medical conditions, uh, researching for the paper of university, or simply finding out who scored in the 1986 FA Cup final. You know, you went to a library, you searched through hundreds of books, thousands of pages to find that one little bit of information you needed to carry on with your day. Then in the 90s, the internet came along. And that, so from that clunky way of finding that information, you know, getting in the car, traveling to a centralized location, scrolling through hundreds of books, thousands of pages to get that one little snippet, that could take, ooh, 
half an hour, two hours, three hours, depending how close you were to a library. Now, to find that little bit of information from the 90s onwards, you type it into a search bar and the information is pulled to you within seconds from any device in any location, doesn't matter where you are and at what time. So that is kind of like a great example to get where what digital transformation is, taking old clunky processes and bringing it into the 21st century and allowing all the people, individuals, organizations to access information and um, in, a, in a far more um, easy and streamlined manner. We've kind of went for that kind of very small example of libraries and what is digital transformation. And this is just the dictionary definition of it, which is effectively reimagining your business for the digital age. So using technology to create new or modify existing business processes to meet the need of your customers and the end of the changing market requirements to future proof your business. So that was just some kind of getting you into picture of what digital transformation is. Hopefully you kind of got an idea of where we're coming from and what we're trying to talk about today. And what we'll, what we'll go through now is kind of the statistics, the numbers behind digital transformation and really start on that process of actually, why should I care? Why is this going to affect me? So this slide's all about information that has been pulled together from organizations like Gartner, McKinsey, PCW, you know, the World Economic Forum, EIU, Forrester's and Forbes. So, Third parties who don't really have any skin in the game, they're not going to benefit from you buying the latest software package or latest IT technology, but really are there to kind of help organisations make the right decisions and investments going forward. Uh, the first one we'll touch on is the first two we'll touch on actually is from EIU, and that's just times two. So actually, EIU found that companies were twice as likely to report an increase in market share compared to their less digitally mature peers. So actually, with regards to gaining more market share, gaining more revenue, gaining more profitability, digital transformation and digital initiatives have shown that can actually double your prospects of doing that. We also, 40% there has also took a survey of C-level um, individuals within businesses across the globe, and they top three benefits of digital transformation and, uh, and digital initiatives. 40% said actually improves operational efficiency, 36 and 36 percent and then second place it allowed them to go to market quicker than their competitors and to take advantage of that and 35 percent said it allowed them to meet their customers expectations more efficiently and quickly 40 percent of business and this comes from the world economic forum they believe from their research that 40 percent of businesses will die in the next 10 years if they do not figure out how to change their entire company to accommodate new technologies. So apologies for some of these statistics coming off a little bit of doom and gloom, but this is what the facts say. 64% of companies with a digital first strategy are more likely to achieve their business goals than their competitors. 27% of senior executives believe in digital transformation is a matter of survival. 56% of CEOs said that digital improvements have already improved their profits, with 26% of digitally mature companies are more profitable than their less mature peers. So the numbers speak for itself. If you are ignoring um, digital enablements to advance customer experience, you know, you're missing out on opportunities, lowering operational expenditure, increasing productivity, and actually, um, doing yourself a disservice with longevity of your organization as well. And, you know, we've, we've done the numbers piece. We're going to go into some pictures and stories and examples now, because if you're a, you're a simple guy like me, I don't like numbers, I don't like statistics, I actually like stories and examples of where digital transformation has been rolled out in specific organizations, so I can actually look at it and see what, what, what can it do for me. And we'll start off with the base of what we'll ignore Amazon, because I feel like we're giving Jeff Bezos and his team a little bit too much so far today. And I think we stick on every one of them, we'll be here all day. But again, if you if you do a quick touch on Amazon, you know, they went from selling books online to now actually being one of the biggest technology companies across all of retail, um, across um, supermarkets that have opened up their own digital food chains now as well. And actually they're, they're probably the biggest technology um, company to rival Microsoft and the Azure platform as well. 
moving across to that, the, the one I like to start off with is kind of specific examples where I think it fits into your day-to-day -day life and you, you've got experience of it. And I think Netflix is a great example. So Netflix um, really um, smashed the trend when it comes to um, consume content. So for example, Saturday night, depending how old you are, I'm not going to ask anyone their age, but so Saturday night, depending um, on where you were, it was either you went with your children or you were taken by your mum and dad to the local blockbuster. Uh, you went and rent, went to look to get a, a tape, probably back then it was, not even a DVD, but you went to go and rent a film for Saturday night to watch with your parents or, or your children, and you'd have to get in the car, travel to a specific location, get to that location, and... Um, I hope that we still had it available because if ever, anyone could actually remember, you actually used to turn up half the time. And if it was a new release, you never actually had it in stock if you didn't get early enough. So then you have to go for the second or third best option for what you wanted. And um, sometimes, especially if you got the DVDs, it was scratched to hell and you can, couldn't actually watch them at all uh, when you got there. And if you didn't bring them back on time, you were fined as well. So fundamentally, when you're looking back, it was a really clunky process. It was time consuming. There's a lot of flaws to it. And it wasn't, it wasn't the best experience that you ever had when actually looking to stream content. Okay. Then Netflix came along. They developed a platform to where you didn't have to leave your house. You could be on a train in your home. You could be in your holiday home, on a beach in Barbados, wherever it be. But as long as you had an internet connection um, and you had a device with the application on it, be it a mobile phone, a tablet, or a laptop, you were able to stream any content or movie or, 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 or television series you wanted at any time. So there was no office time like there was with Blockbuster, nine for nine. If you know you had no late fees for returning and you were able to consume the content whenever you wanted, right? And now look at it. When's the last time anyone went to Blockbuster? I don't think I've seen a Blockbuster in about five years. That's a great example to where an organization has recognized where the world's going using technology to really capture large segments of a market share, right? And, and take over, right? Delivering a better customer experience at a lower cost, right? And really people jump to it. And I think that's one of the examples you'll see in kind of a current trait going through these examples that we go through is, you know, a, a quote I like to use from Wayne Gretzky, who was an ice hockey player over in America. He always said, the reason why I was such a good hockey player was because I never went to where the puck was, I went to where the puck was going, right? And these, all the examples here today really just kind of have that same mantra and methodology behind it. Another example we can pick on there is Domino's. So Domino's in 2011, and yes, I am pick, the size of me, I am picking on the takeaway because it is close to my heart. But in 2011, Domino's were the first to release an application to where if you were on a smartphone, you were able to order uh, your takeaway and not have to find out, you know, your local branch, um, phone them up, speak to someone, and then process payments over the phone or do it when someone arrived. Actually, the aim of the app was when it was first released, you could actually, from opening the application on your device to placing the order and paying for it and order being confirmed, you could do it in 17 seconds. The whole method, the whole thought process behind that was the time it took to go from red to green in a traffic stop. And now you look at it, I think if you ask anyone now, um, when's the last time they actually phoned up for the takeaway? The majority of people say it, it's, it's a rarity. Everyone uses things like Uber Eats, use Just Eats, uh, Deliveroo, or, or, or any other application that's based on a smartphone. So again, they changed the way people order their food and got their outcomes to a far more um, streamlined method, um, far more enjoyable experience for the end user, and again, people changed. People wanted to move in that direction. And they took a huge market share from 2011 just because of application, because that's how people want to order their food in future. Um, and another example we can touch on is Nike as well. So a great story about Nike with regards to their digital innovation. They were able to increase within the first 12 months of rolling out um, their digital strategy. They were able to increase their sales by by a hundred percent in the first twelve months, and that was by rolling out their Nike Plus program. So, again, going back to the old way of doing things, if you were again, if you were, if you were old enough, you're young enough. I'm not sure if people still do go to Clark's nowadays. Um, my wife's the one that looks after the kids' feet, to be fair. Um, so Clark's in the day you used to go back with your mum, you used to sit down, and they used to measure your feet 
so you get the right size. You might not buy your school shoes from Clark, but you'll use that sizing guide to go elsewhere to, to, to acquire your shoes. And Nike took that premise and advanced it through machine learning and algorithms. So they released the Nike sneakers, they call it the applications, but it's S-N-K-R-S, right? And what that actually does is that application, when someone came to, came to the shop to look for shoes, it would take a full leg scan right, and from 13 data points, be able to advise the customer what was the best shoe for them, the most comfortable, what would fit them and their needs. So automatically, the experience to the customer is heightened from the traditional way of just walking up and down an aisle, guessing and asking someone to go into the back to get the shoe for them. This application actually said, right, we're going to tell you what you need. It advanced the customer satisfaction dramatically made them far stickier as well because people want to come for that experience but also on the background of it from those 13 data points they were able to capture all the customer's information feed that back to the to the company's design team and from that pool of information the design team were able to digitize 6,000 footwear materials and then design shoes based on statistics and based on what customers needed and wanted. So what it did was it increased sales, reduced the friction between design, production, and sales, and just increased productivity dramatically as well. So a really great example of how taking something gold, bringing it into the digital world, dramatically increasing your sales and profitability. Capital One is another great example. So Capital One, are, you know, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, were kind of, and given the, the badge of revolutionizing banking, so they really heavily invested in the, the, the solely digitized banking model that AMG Direct when they bought them. And what they were able to do is morph themselves into that digital innovation leader within banking. You know, actually, they now have they consider a software powerhouse now with over 11,000 staff just in their software division and with 500 AI patents as well under the bank. And that's for a banking organization. But what that led to, they were the first to release an app for banking to be able to, um, for, for overdrafts, for applying for credit cards, for checking your credit call, uh, and for any of your credit needs, um, reducing the amount of needs on people actually having to physically go to a location and driving all the traffic online to reduce the friction, increase customer satisfaction, because again, where the puck's going, not where the puck was. They're not after people who were enjoyed going to a bank in the 50s or 60s. They were going for that generation who actually wanted to do everything through the mobile phone, through a device, and not have to go to a specific location. And the industry's followed suit. You've got you know, your HSBC and that, where whoever it is now, it's all very much a digital-first approach with a limited number of high street banks as well. How, as negative or as positive as that is, Capital One started that and the, and the market followed. And because of that, they were able to gain huge gains in market share because they were first to market with their digital initiatives as well. And the common, you know, the common traits through all of them, right? Even though there's different verticals, different industries, different go-to markets and different products, there's a common trait through it all. It's that Wayne Gretzky, Wayne Gretzky slogan, not where the puck is, where the puck's going. They increased efficiency through digitization, and that translated into lower production costs and more profit productivity for productivity and more profitability for the organization itself, but also a huge cost savings for the customers and an increase in customer satisfaction and loyalty. Because they were using technology to reduce the friction from operations to sales and marketing, it was all accomplished by removing those clunky, those clunky systems, streamlining them, joining them up, or just getting rid of them and replacing them with something better with technology, machine learning, or AI, right? So allowing to make those connections faster to increase that productivity. And that is a very general, well, this is what Amazon, Netflix, the banking world, the retail world did. This is quite specific to what the, the lifting industry can do. And shock horror, I'm going to talk about my organization and what we can help you with. I think I'd get sacked if I didn't, but here we are. Um, so in my experience of dealing with everything from housing to, to, to banking to in my software days, coming into the lifting industry, a lot of, well, I'm not saying everyone, obviously, there's still a lot of people have made some great advances in that industry, 
but there's still huge swathes of the industry who are very paper driven, who are very through with manual process, and that can be down to many reasons, right? But one of the ones that keeps on coming up in my conversations personally, and please in the QA session after this, tell me I'm wrong and argue with me, that is fine, I'm happy with that. Um, but one of the one of the key ones that keeps on coming up is just because we've always done it this way, right? And that is one of the most dangerous slogans in in industry, right? We've always done it this way. But what we can help here is for something that has always been done a certain way is looking at the, the Lola search, for example. So traditionally, if you've got an organization who have 100, 1,000 bits of kits that need to be Lola certified every six to 12 months, it's a lot of paperwork, okay? It's a lot of certifications that need to write up and it can take a long time to do. So again, it's quite a clunky process if it's paper-driven. You've got to go and go to sites. You've got to... Uh, find the bits of equipment, you've got to look at the serial numbers, you've got to physically write out the forms, you then got to create a copy for the customer, maybe scan them and upload them to a digitized system or a, a SharePoint holding place, and then within 28 days be able to share that with the customer. What Checked OK allows you to do is automate all the clunky side of that process. So it fully automates the creation of everything from Lola, Lola certs, uh, pure certs, uh, DOCs, PSSRs, uh, your, your, your point of work assessments and your RAMs, as well as your engineering time sheets and job sheets, all driven out of a cloud-based application delivered to whatever um, whatever device you have, be it a laptop, be it a tablet, be it a mobile phone, uh, allows you to automate the creation of these certs. So it allows your guys to, to do what they're good at, go to sites, engage with your customers, delivering the, delivering the service that they want, inspect the kit to make sure that it is up to standard and then fundamentally take a lot of the workload off them to creating the certification. So through a couple of tick boxes and a couple of inputs on an application, on a device, they are able to create hundreds, thousands of certifications, not within hours, days, weeks, within minutes. So taking what is traditionally a manual process that is quite clunky and not very streamlined and a bit disjointed, linking it all up, using technology to automate where it is possible, remove the need for uh, human interaction uh, uh, and remove human error, removing pen and paper, and deliver what is a far more streamlined, far more efficient process as well. The benefit to that is as well is because it's all based in the cloud and our data centers, um, your customers are able to access their certifications far quicker than they ever have before. If they get their own logins, if they want to look at the inspection history, the asset register, the, all the certificates, the color codes, lamps, whatever it be, they can drill down to individual serial numbers and find all the information they need about that asset and the history for however long that is necessary. And this is what we're able to automate through the software, right? So traditionally, again, not to lie to the points, not to say that anyone's doing it wrong, but there is more advanced ways we can help with automation, everything from asset identification to advanced RFID tagging technologies, syncing in to our checked OK platform, to all your report authorities for inspection, for installation, or your audience and service management can all be fully automated and all centralized in our cloud-based infrastructure. And what does this lead to? I always say to the four S's, right? The, the benefits of software as a service, which is what this is, is nice and simple, again, because I'm a simple guy, is the four S's. So speed, savings, simplicity, and scalability, right? So inspections itself and the data quality, because we're replacing pen and paper, because we're getting it all automated and collected automatically, what we're able to do is we're able to deliver better conformance rates at a much lower cost to you as an organization and therefore your customers. Right, because we utilize RFID technology as well to track the assets through uh, GPS and also actually rather than have to search for individual serial numbers, you just scan them and it pops up automatically and allows you to perform uh, whatever you need to do on that bit of a kit. It actually means that your kit is better available and there's a massive reduction in lost assets because of that GPS RFID technology. And also, because of this combined, because we're making you more efficient, we're making you more cost effective, your compliance is better, right? It is dramatically improving your customer service and therefore your customer loyalty. 
And because we're reclaiming so much time with your engineers through automation, so one of our customers, for example, that have recently on board, that they were able to reclaim two days a week of their engineering time just because of this level of automation, they can now go out, do more jobs, and get more billable hours. So therefore, we're reducing your costs, we're increasing customer loyalty, and we're allowing you to bill more billable hours, so therefore increasing your productivity. And just, to, just in summary of, of DT or DX, as, as, as it's been termed now, digital transformation, is it engages your customers by providing a better user experience. So it keeps those customers stickier, makes them happier, and allows you to build greater customer loyalty for your brand. It also improves, it also actually improves employees' motivation. Okay, so, so a statistic that we didn't share before was Gartner released, I think, in the middle of the pandemic. I can't remember the date, uh, but it was uh, they did a survey of university leavers, um, and I can't, don't know if that's Gen X, Gen Y, Gen Z, or, or whoever wants to label themselves, whatever nowadays. But effectively, seventy percent of those university leavers said they would be more willing to join an organisation that delivered them the digital tools for them to be successful in their role than an organisation that didn't and paid them more money. So these people are willing to take a little bit less money for the digital tools to allow them to pull on their job, okay? So actually, when you think of um, future-proofing your business, when you think of the opportunities that are available through digitization and innovation, actually, one of the big things is actually making yourself more competitive in the labor market, which is exceptionally tight at the moment. So if you've got customer A and customer B, one who doesn't have these digital initiatives, but customer B, well, company B does, right? The cream of the crop are going to want to go with company B, and it's proven in the statistics. So to get the best people, to get the best employees, you've got to deliver the technologies they feel will allow them to perform their jobs on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, we've covered this numerous times. It makes an organization far more efficient if you're removing clunky processes with streamlined automation. And then also it guarantees that you can increase your revenue with these technologies as well and innovations. Right. So look, I know, I know we were talking about innovation lifting and you might have been expecting, you know, hovercraft cranes or whatever it be, but I'd like to say thank you very much for your time to, to sitting in and listening to, to, to me talk about software uh, and digital transformation and how it can benefit your organization. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and have this opportunity to talk to you about the technical inspection revolution that's happening and impacting us all, both today and will continue in the future. My name's Lynn Reeves. I'm the Managing Director here at Motion Software. So let's get started. I can make the slides move. So as technology continues to advance at an unprecedented pace, we're set to see the lifting industry become safer and more efficient than ever. But how? Through smarter and more advanced technology. Over the past few years, we've seen advanced technologies being used more and more throughout our everyday lives, including in the workplace. In regards to inspections, these advances have helped us to revolutionize the inspection processes and practices including better safety, compliance, and business efficiency. It's worth noticing that technology should be seen really as an aid though, and should never fully replace the need for human involvement in inspections. Rather, it should enhance the human interaction element, allowing just us mere people to focus on more important things and leave the computers to manage the rest. So without further ado, let's just dive in and explore what fascinating opportunities lie ahead of us. One of the key technical advances revolutionizing industrial inspections is robotics. Robots equipped with advanced sensors, cameras, and artificial intelligence algorithms are capable of performing inspections in hazardous and hard to reach areas. So that minimizes human exposure to the risks. The robots can swiftly uh, navigate through complex environments, capture high resolution imagery, and gather real-time data, all the while maintaining high precision and accuracy. In recent times, drones have also, uh, sorry, drones have also transformed the way inspections are conducted because they can easily access areas that are otherwise difficult to reach. If you imagine um, tall structures, rooftops, 
and vast industrial um, sites. They're equipped with cameras, sensors, and in some cases, thermal imaging capabilities. So you can catch or de capture detailed visual uh, data, detect anomalies, and identify potential issues, which thereby improves inspection efficiency and, more importantly, or as importantly, safety. Both of these technologies help to reduce the risk, obviously, to human inspectors. Next up, we have the Internet of Things, or IO2, as it's sometimes known. The Internet of Things has paved the way for interconnected devices and sensor networks that enable real-time monitoring and data collection. Smart sensors installed on industrial equipment can continuously monitor parameters like temperature, pressure, vibration, and, and much, much more. Data is transmitted then to a central system, enabling proactive maintenance and early detection of abnormalities or safety hazards. This then obviously reduces downtime and improves the overall operational efficiency. The Internet of Things can also reduce the need for physical presence uh, on the inspection site, allowing again humans to focus efforts on more worthwhile tasks. So, what about augmented reality and virtual reality? Of course, nothing replaces the real thing, um, but initial upskilling of your workforce safely and effectively through the use of VR is something that a number of you are probably already doing. And both AR and VR are fully immersive and interactive, so they can offer a way for fewer workers to need to be physically present at an inspection site. Obviously, that also saves you time and travel costs, a little similar to the, the Internet of Things. Next up, we've got blockchain. Blockchain technology is another advance which could offer a secure and immutable platform for recording and managing inspection data. By utilizing decentralized and distributed ledgers, blockchain could ensure that inspection records are tamper-proof and transparent. And the nature of blockchain enhances regulatory compliance and auditability uh, as it provides a clear and traceable history of inspections. In addition, smart contracts can also be implemented on blockchain, which would automate inspection uh, related processes. The self executing contracts streamline workflow, reduce admin overhead, and ensure the efficient execution of tasks. And then finally, we have one maybe which is a little more familiar to you barcodes and QR codes. Now, these play a vital role in expediting and simplifying the process of capturing uh, equipment information during inspections. By assigning unique codes to each item, inspectors can quickly scan those codes using a mobile device or scanner to access digital items. Uh, it's an efficient method. It ensures accurate documentation and, of inspections and maintenance activities. They can facilitate proactive maintenance too by enabling inspectors to identify equipment with specific needs and maybe based on past inspection data. Overall, the use of QR and barcode streamlines the inspection process, enhances accuracy and promotes effective maintenance management. In fact, QR code scanning is an additional feature we've recently added into Kinetic, the motion software inspection solution in addition to the more traditional barcode and RFID options. Now, as I'm sure you know, with all kinds of new technology and advances comes challenges and important factors that we have to consider. And it's no different for us um, and the future of inspections. The future of industrial inspections is an exciting blend of technical advances and human, inter human interaction. Uh, robots, drones, Internet of Things, augmented reality, virtual reality, blockchain, all of those things that I've mentioned are and will likely further transform the future inspection landscape, ultimately making it a safer, more efficient and data driven industry. For those advances to perform well and deliver the business efficiency that we need, though, there needs to be significant investment and infrastructure upgrades, as well as addressing any particular privacy or security concerns, and then providing required training and upskilling. These are all things that have got to be considered when we introduce new technology. What remains though, however far technology may move along, humans are still gonna remain central to the inspection process, but instead they'll be contributing their expertise, decision-making abilities, collaboration skills, and intuition, 
it's important we embrace all technology advances. So here we are then thinking uh, about and seeing how inspections are and will continue to advance using technology in the future. I think it's really exciting. We're looking at a more efficient, accurate and safer future in the world of lifting. I for one can't wait. Everyone's long-term vision is to enable companies to save both time, which is money, as well as consistently remaining compliant within the evolving landscape of inspections. And lastly, thank you. Thank you all for your time today. Please feel free to visit our website, um, which is on screen now, or you can email if you've got any questions or want to talk further about today's presentation. I hope you have a great afternoon and thank you for listening. Hi, uh, thanks for finding some time in your diary to come and talk to us. Um, about what you're seeing within the industry in relation to technology. We talk a lot, and so I um, I really value being able to pick your brains and to see what you're seeing globally and, and in your readership, both in terms of my little bit of the industry, but also in terms of the end user markets that you also service. No, sure. So, so um, yeah, how, sh should we start off with you talking, or do you want to see what we're doing at Leah? Well, I mean... Yeah, let's start with Leah, I think. I mean, um, I mean, how is technology changing Leah and trade associations in general, the way you do things? Yeah, so, Cracky, what a great question to start. <laughs> um, so, obviously, Leah's nearly 80 years old, and in its history, it's, it's foundationally been a technical trade association. And more and more, I'm seeing technology and technical is almost being sort of brothers at arms really and um th that's been key to what we at the trade association have been doing you have to remember what are, what are trade associations what's the point right and if you can't argue that if you can't remember why a trade association exists you probably shouldn't be running one but for, <laughs> for me a, a trade association is when effectively when you get the market together and they correct market failure, but also they work on stuff where the benefit of working together outweighs the costs. And so LEA members compete with each other tooth and nail on a daily basis, but they trust us, the association, to work on solutions that support them collectively better. And I, when I speak to other trade associations, not naming any names, we are definitely ahead of the curve as a trade association that utilizes new methods and modes of things that are out there so i i think you know off the top of my head stuff that we have done recently that's utilized technology i witter on about our training offer right so training used to be face to face before that even it used to be correspondence so you would fill it in put it in an envelope and send it yeah. we changed away from that and so that that's brought huge advantage. So our, our training is now in three different ways. So you can do formal online e-learning training, but you can also do Zoom training as well as face-to-face. -face. And some of that is because just of the patterns of how behaviors changed around COVID and then following on. You know, if you if you spoke to somebody five years ago, right? If you got in your DeLorean and went back five years ago and said, oh yeah, you won't do face-to-face -face meetings for the majority now, you'll just jump on Zoom or um, Teams. People would have said, you know, get real, that's ridiculous. But for us as a training provider, I mean, just this week, we've been running a Zoom course. And I, when I was in the office earlier this week, I just poked my head around and we had, we had um, students from around the world who, because they were utilizing Zoom, they weren't out of the office, so they were still around if an emergency came. Their employer wasn't having to pay for them to travel. Their employer wasn't having to pay for them to be in a hotel. And so technology is happening. And there's always this reticence to, you know, things are different. And you can think that because things are different, they should be avoided or they are worse. Um, but technology brings excitement and it brings challenges and it's about finding that balance and you know we, we're doing things that I think would I have done it without the pandemic but 
our world has fundamentally changed. Well, and can it be considered like a double-edged sword, do you think? I mean, you've, you've talked about, I mean, one of the, I mean, you mentioned, obviously, the importance of training, per se, um, and doing that remotely, so being in the office. So you don't have to leave the office, you're there on hand to deal with any problems. You can interrupt the training potentially, should you need to deal with an important problem, provide a solution to a client. And then of course, another key benefit is um, it puts less strain on, on the networks, um, whether that's train, road, um, you know, the traveling, the economy, um, but there are pitfalls too, aren't there? And I mean, I, I spoke to another trade association a, a year or two ago, and there was some concern around, are these people who are undertaking the training course actually the people undertaking the training course? Yeah. How do you prove that? And one of the things that they brought in was facial, facial recognition to, to really support and prove that that individual has completed the training course they've signed up to complete. Yeah, you're, you're dead right. And of course it is this dual-edged sword and double-edged sword of excitement, challenge, but also disruption and threat. Um, I think, talking about the industry I represent, we are engineers, and so we are used to dealing with challenges and finding solutions. I mean, the example you're talking about is, is absolutely one that we've um, we've wrestled with. It's all very well doing online, but does that just mean that you're degrading the value? Does that mean that cheating's happening? Um, I mean, what we what we've done is we utilize all the same security measures that Ivy League universities use in the US. Okay. And and then and then you know you go to the back end and I love a bit of data, right? But um, our pass marks are within one percent, exactly the same for our online as they are for our face to face. So we we see no evidence of cheating. And if we do, we're really draconian about it. If we find a cheat, it's a lifetime ban. And in our industry, if you get a lifetime ban from a LEA qualification, that will impact on your ability to learn and therefore your ability to earn. And so um, we think we've been pretty, I use the word draconian. Yeah, I think we have been, you know, if, if there's ever a whiff of it, we, we come down really hard on it. But but I, I do think that, um, I mean, like you, I, I get to speak, the best part of my job is I get to speak to business owners and I, I just hear their brilliant stories about what they're doing and what they're struggling with and what's keeping them awake at night, but also just these unbelievably innovative brains that start up and run successful businesses. And then, um, yeah, disruption's a thing. You know, what, what we do now is different and that can be meetings, but that can also be all the technology that's coming in to do with inspection. So whilst we are our opponent, our adversary is gravity, and that has been the opponent we've had for 80 years, the solutions that we're coming up with are fundamentally different. And it's how we make sure that disruption, we take all the good bits and we we leave behind the bad. I mean, yeah. for, for instance, me, right? So my role as chief executive of a trade association, I spend a lot of time with people. Um, and Zoom and Teams has meant that I get to spend more time with more people. But I also think it's a mistake if you're not doing face-to-face. -face. I would agree. There's no substitute for face-to-face, -face really. Um, yeah. When, when we visit exhibitions, trade shows, seminars, conferences, etc., uh, as you've already alluded to, that connectivity, that that face, that FaceTime, that opportunity. To yeah, see. but internally as well, right? Oh, but, absolutely, absolutely. Something I, I think I've noticed within Leah, but also outside, is that Teams is a really good uh, project tool. And what I mean by that is, you know, when you do a project and you treat it as like a relay race with a bat on, yeah. When you do something and then you pass it on to somebody else and then they pass it on to somebody else. So Teams is really good when you can effectively say, this is what I've done, it's over to you. Um, but it's not as good for that sitting around a table, conversing, finding fault in ideas, changing the idea, purifying the idea. So got a role, but um, you know, I, I, I still think that 
the way forward is not to be technology exclusively reliant, but to actually recognize it that you you know you're putting a brand new shiny driver in your golf bag effectively. Um, that doesn't mean you don't still need your pitching wedge. You know. No, fair enough. I mean, let me ask you. I mean, with the the advent of technology, and especially after the pandemic, um, what other operational changes have you seen specifically, and and Leah as an association? Yeah, um, I'll tell you one thing that's really been made a, made a big difference to to me within the association. Um, hybrid working is something that we are still. Um, you know, the, the world in general is probably still wrestling with. But for me, that runs an association globally, um, the technologically change, technological change that supports hybrid working has been hugely advantageous. So I'm much able, I'm much more able to stay close to my colleagues who we've got working in Sydney, who we've got working in Saudi. Um, but it also extends my talent pool so that in the UK, I, I don't think I would dream for most roles of saying that you have to be within an hour of our HQ anymore. I think that now we would recognize that, you know, some roles, of course, that's going to be important. Hands on. In the yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But but for, for specialist roles, it means that I'm able to throw my recruitment umbrella much wider which means I'm going to be able to get better people, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, because I'm based in Huntington, so it's kind of the middle of nowhere, really. Um, Central Universe, Ross. Well, yeah, of course it is. <laughs> but, but particularly when you think that, you know, where, where would you go for lifting equipment expertise in the, in the UK? I'm probably looking at the hot spots where there's population base. You know, but the mind would think, well, Aberdeen, you know, um, and Aberdeen's not an hour away from Huntington. No, indeed. So there's there's that, but um, but but like, like I was just saying about talent pool. You know, you you speak to a managing director in the lifting equipment industry, and the number one thing that keeps them awake at night is recruitment. Everybody struggles with recruitment, and maybe maybe that is the main thing that we're going to get out of technology: the ability to work further away from each other but closer to each other well i think you've kind of hit the nail on the head there really i mean it's almost like a chicken and egg question isn't it which came first or what is driving what um you know is the increasingly difficult task of finding trainees or replacing redundant jobs people who have naturally left because of age retirement etc is that driving the need for automation and technology or is in fact technology making these jobs redundant? Um, I mean, what, what are people telling you, you know, in the field? What, what, what's the sort of feedback you're getting there? Yeah, another great question, Guy. You should definitely think about this as a career. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, think, I think the feedback I get is that people are looking at technology in two very distinct ways. So people see it and feel the benefit that it brings to their everyday life. And that can be as simple as on a mobile phone. You know, there is just a benefit to technology. Um, and yet a benefit to private life, but a threat to work life. And so there is still that there is that bit of, of uncertainty around what is this going to do to work patterns, work patterns and the sort of jobs that people will actually pay for and of course i'm thinking about you know chat gpt and ai and all that sort of stuff so that's still in its infancy so we're all looking at it thinking is my job still going to exist in 20 years i was reading today that some professor of ai has come out and said he doesn't think that we'll need high school level teachers um very quickly um, yeah, i don't know about that but but i think the thing to get our industry thinking about is we are engineers this is a challenge and it's an opportunity we are really good at grasping the opportunity and overcoming threats and you know the the, the guys that are going to come up with solutions not somebody like me they're going to be the guys that are actually on the front line that deal with this day to day well what, what i would say is that you can't stop change um I mean, I mean, and obviously, as you 
you know, continually say, and rightly so, you know, we're in the gravity business, we're fighting gravity. Um, and you could argue that cranes um, and um, lifting devices uh, haven't changed much in mm -hmm. hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, the big change that I see now is um, 5G technology and that connectivity. And it's really, I suppose, um, uh, uh, the main importance is efficiency and safety in a busier, more populated world, more demand for free flowing goods. Um, so that efficiency and that safety uh, is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a massive concern. Uh, but connectivity through 5G networks um, has already started to improve so many different aspects of the lifting industry, such as safety software, predictive maintenance and monitoring, anti-collision systems. I mean, we're in an environment, we're in a world where, you know, if, if you're lucky enough to have one of these fridges, it can actually notify the manufacturer or the, or the service provider to say, I need a new part. And a new part is delivered to said service provider. And then they phone you up and say, right, we need to fit this sometime next week. Are you available? You know, this is what I'm talking about. And that and that lack of latency that 5G brings, excuse me, um, really enables automation to work in a much more, um, in, a, in a more real time environment. I mean, you know, if you're talking about um, um, sort of remote operation of a crane, automation does most of it. Um, there's just someone at the end, because these things aren't hardwired, right? So, you know, there's, there's someone at the, at the end of that, that signal really just there to push a button should they need to stop that crane if something, you know, determines that, you know, they've got to stop the job in task because, you know, it's due to safety mm. um, or, uh, or, or a, a mis misfunctioning part. So, I mean, that's, I think, something that really we can't get away from now. Um, you talked about AI. I mean, I don't think we've really... We, it's the tip of the iceberg isn't it really yeah but it, it is but um <coughs> i uh i had a board meeting with the Leah board last week and i mean just the fact that we are talking about how we can utilize ai i just not crack it what, what a brilliant what a brilliant approach we we have within our industry that as soon as we see a tool we think right how can we use it you know that, and and it's this sort of you know, excitement, but nervousness. But our industry is one that is characterised by excitement, um, and we're we're looking at uh, Chat GPT as a way by which we can hugely improve the intelligence share that we undertake. Because if you think, you know, going back, what what is a trade association? Our number one function really is to share information. Yeah. That, that, that's what we do and i have reservations about that i have to say about chat gpt yeah because it's all it's, it's all in the sort of like you know the electronic soup isn't it so all it's doing is taking information that's already there i mean i mean with ai isn't necessarily fr free thinking at the moment so no. everything that you get is is essentially already there it's just been it's just been compiled in a different way in a way that's acceptable to use and certainly to the layman but that's that suits what i'm doing at the moment because leah produces reams and reams of guidance documents and so our challenge has always been how do we disseminate that and any tool that helps us disseminate so i'm not i don't need new i i, I in my head we still produce the content but we're using ai as a dissemination tool okay and, yeah. and the thing i'm getting really excited about of course is it's not going to be a million miles away until language isn't a barrier anymore. Very much so. These yeah. tools, you know, I'm not sure it's just around the corner, but I'm aware that it's coming quickly. That language is, and you know, we've all used translation tools that are absolutely rubbish, right? So, but they are they are getting better and better. And language just isn't going to be this barrier, which for a trade association like me, based in the UK with members globally has been something that's been expensive to the point of being insurmountable previously. Yeah, no, I think it's, I think it's hugely exciting, that aspect of it, especially. Uh, and I think it will um, break down a lot of walls and open a lot of doors. Um, I mean, 
have you spoken to any of your members uh, or have any of your members posed concerns regarding the job market and, and how they feel that technology, the rise of technology could potentially affect them individually or the workforce as a whole? Yeah, it won't surprise you that probably the main thing that I speak to members about is uh, concern about job market. Mm. Um, we just haven't got enough people that are entering the labour market. And Indeed. and and when, uh, so we, sh the engineering sectors in general struggle with recruitment at the moment. Um, worldwide views on um, immigration are challenging for us at times current inflation rates and wage expectations are extremely challenging and so um, recruitment is the number one thing that worries my members owners or mds um, if technology is a way by which we can solve that problem i think we'd bite its hand off to make yeah. But, I mean, but, that, but, but going right back to the beginning, we're at the infancy of so much of this. No, indeed. I mean, I, I think, you know, um, I mean, there's studies to suggest that, you know, 5G, especially, you know, that, you know, that ultra connectivity will have um, a, a real uh, global economic effect by 2035. And I believe they're predicting that it's going to put something like 13 trillion onto the global economy and it could create as many as 23 million additional jobs and and i think that goes beyond just the the normal sort of network you know sort of mobile yeah. industries you know it's, it's the suggestions are that it will in fact you know help things like for example the, the automotive industry which is a massive lifting segment um but i i'm still unclear if i'm honest how that will really play out in in the lifting industry um and how it will affect day-to-day -day jobs i mean i mean look at dark warehouses for example i mean if you go to if you go to chicago uh and the mhi mhi event uh proma which they're buying an event um there has been a noticeable increase of robots and automated processes and equipment on display there in in recent years you know, it's exponentially growing. Um, and that is partly to support things like dark warehouses, which really, I guess, came into their own around the pandemic. Yeah. You know, when you talk about social distancing, you know, people couldn't ultimately get to work or, you know, they were, weren't able to get to work. This is where they came into their own. Um, you know, ro robots don't need holidays. They don't complain. <laughs> you know, they can work in, you know, any, you know, and they can work in, you know, dangerous and cold environments. Um, but you have to consider, of course, that setting up a dark warehouse, for example, or bringing in this kind of technology is massively expensive. But in the long run, <coughs> it's probably cheaper. Um, so how is that going to affect, you know, operators, people who, you know, historically have picked, sorted and released goods from warehouses, for example? Uh, has anyone talked to you about that? Anyone share yeah. any sort of visions or, or thoughts? Yeah, um, I think <coughs> you know what we take from that is that um, in the, the work environment is changing, right? That that is that is the thing that all of us are going to be looking at, and so the skills that we have right now are not going to be the skills that keep us in work in ten years, and so that flips back to speaking at an individual level that fleet that flips back to the necessity of lifelong learning so all of us yeah. all of us have got our medals right but yeah. none of those medals are going to be good enough for 10 years and so you know that and that fits with us as an association that we believe in continuous professional development and i don't just mean that in a sort of throwaway term but actually all of us need to be refreshing and updating our skills because the challenges that we have are going to be different in 10 years i'm still going to be working in 10 years i want I, I, i'm not like you guy i want to pay off my mortgage in 10 years but you know all of us that are in the workplace you know we we are always we're on this journey of 
staying employable. And no, that's uh, a very good point. And I mean, you know, I, I remember being at, at college uh, doing doing my journalism course back in the mid nineties, and one of my uh, tutors saying to me, he "said you may not be a journalist in ten years' time, five years' time. Um, you know, we are now we, we we have now left the era where you you learn something at university or you learn a trade and you see that out for the remainder of your working life. You know, you will probably have to change um, roles." Uh, and adjust to, yeah. to, you know, career moves in the changing world, you know, and that was what thirty years ago. Yeah. So you know, here we are, and, and it seems you know, even more real than it did then, to be honest. Yeah, but but as the advocate of lifting, lifting's not going to stop. This no. is an industry that will be here. You know, you can think of industries, particularly here in the UK, that just don't exist anymore. But the lifting industry will go on for time and for all of it eternity because we're always going to be wanting to do stuff as a human race that lifting allows but the manner in which it happens will change so safe industry but changing roles within it and i think i, mean, I could agree more i mean something i said earlier was you know lifting or the basics of lifting hasn't really changed in mm. thousands of years i do think we're in a new era now or at the beginning of a this sounds corny doesn't it the beginning of a new dawn yeah, I think technology yeah. is going to radically change our industry and what we do. And, you know, going back to that connectivity, um, you know, the use of mobile devices, um, I think that is really going to be the driving force behind that change in the lifting industry specifically. Yeah, brilliant. Well, that, that sounded like poignant and deep, guys. That's probably a good place to end. Well, oh, I would finish up with saying that, you know, um, despite this change, you know, you know, and the advent and rise of AI, I don't think we're looking down some Terminator style dystopian future just yet. No, no. <laughs> but, but I've, I've been known to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> good. So, look, thank you for your time. That was it's always good to pick your brains. Um, it's great to speak to you. As ever, Guy, thanks for your ongoing support. I just wish everyone a, a, a great, happy and successful glad. Yeah, brilliant. Good to see you again. Good to see you too, Ross. Thank you Me very too. much. Bye.